sweet, sweet lips, your perfect nose, your rosy cheeks, your ten little toes, your precious little pee-pee, your wondrous eyes, your tender bottom, your pink chubby thighs. We've waited so long for you to come. I'm your dad. Welcome to Beppe Presents. Birth and Early Parenting Educators is an alliance of professionals interested in and focused on the first period of human development from conception to birth and breastfeeding. This is a dramatically important aspect of human development, perhaps the most important time for human beings in their development. And this is because we've learned recently that the baby in the womb is extraordinarily sensitive and vulnerable and open and communicative as we were never able to know before. And we want to get the message of, the, of, this new, of these new discoveries out to parents so they can benefit from them as soon as possible. This program you're about to see is one in a series of programs that we've prepared for you, which we hope will be very fascinating and illuminates this period of human development. You're perfectly, perfect. experiences with this um, were when I was still single and a girlfriend of mine was um, having her first baby and invited me to her birth. And so I went and it was my first experience with birth and it was horrible. But it was normal birth in a hospital. She went in, got hooked up to all the monitors, the IVs, got her epidural and things just started going downhill from there. You know, epidural made her blood pressure just crash. That turned it into a big emergency. Baby wasn't coming out fast enough, so they used forceps. It was excruciating for my girlfriend. She was screaming, wait, please wait, it, it hurts, it hurts, and he wouldn't listen. And finally, he did reposition the forceps, pulled that baby out of her. The baby was screaming, they took the baby separate from her. I was just in shock. I had to close my eyes when they did the episiotomy. I just could not watch that. Um, this baby was screaming. She was just completely out of it because of all the trauma that had just happened to her. I had to go to this baby because I couldn't let this child just scream and be alone. So I went to him and tried to soothe him and and just my presence there really did help and I I stayed connected with that child for the first several years of his life I was like his second mom he felt that pain he felt that fear but that's normal birth in the hospital And me, I didn't know any better. I thought that's the way it was, but I went home and I, would, I was going to say I was in tears for several days, but obviously <laughs> and I knew that that's not what birth is supposed to be like. It is not what birth is supposed to be like. And I started having, you know, some kind of daydreams in my mind about what did women in the old times do? You know, and has, having visions of them holding the bedposts as they squatted in the, in, you know, in, the, uh, in their bedroom of their own home. And the midwife or the doctor or, or one of the grandmothers in the community would come and, and attend to them and, and she would birth their babies at home. And I did have my baby at home. 
and it was it was long too, but it was worth it. It was hard, but it was worth every minute of it. And um, you know, she got to. I ended up having to be transported because of a retained pl placenta. No way around that. I had to go. And but my baby got to stay at home, and she was safe. And I breastfed her first, and we bonded. And let me tell you. After the birth and, you know, just sitting there and looking at my baby, I was looking at her and looking at who she was and seeing her beautiful face for the first time, searching her eyes as she was doing the same thing. And I have a snapshot of that. She looking into my eyes and just seeing who I was, seeing me for the first time. And it was beautiful. Let me tell you, they say that the babies aren't aware and they don't know what's going on. They've never allowed themselves the space to really be, and the, to be present, to experience that. It's there. It's there with all of them, if they only will allow it. Let me tell you, I had a 24 hour long labor that was very hard and, but, you know, it, it is what it is, and it was worth every second of it, but I went through so much more at the hospital in the few hours that I was in the hospital getting that placenta taken out and suffer, suffered physical damage, emotional. It, and the doctor even called us at home the next morning within hours of us getting back to our home, berating us for what were we thinking. What was I thinking going to see him is what I was thinking. What was I thinking for going there? That was way worse than anything else. But they didn't get their hands on my baby. They wanted her. Where's the baby? Where's the baby? And she's fine. She's safe and her tummy's full and she's being loved and cuddled and she's safe. And I, I had my baby the whole time. You know, I got that, those precious moments after the birth. Yeah looking into her eyes and she looking into my eyes you know my husband was there too and just the three of us that that those precious moments of bonding that yeah. are just there are no words to describe it and and you're robbed of that in the hospital you're robbed of it and you can never get that back i don't know why women don't trust themselves and why they look to outside authority over yeah. their own gut I have um, attended birth since 1973, having had my first, but my baby, my first child, well, my second child in 1972. I had a baby in 1967 when I was 18 that I gave up for adoption in Los Angeles and I was treated so horribly that there's just no way you could have paid me to go back to a hospital. So I was gonna deliver at home alone. I was in fact going to go out in the Redwood trees out in Sonoma County and um, I saw Suzanne Arms speak in 1971 in January and heard the word midwife for the first time and decided, okay, I could find a midwife. And so I had a home birth. Now, you guys know, but the public may not know, that um, midwifery restarted itself in this country by women doing what's called have one, see one, catch one. So you would go to, you'd have your own baby. So I had Callie at home with a midwife and um, Nancy Mills out of Sonoma County. And then I um, went to Salida, Colorado and a woman wanted to have her baby with me. And I'm like, well, I don't know anything. So I called this wonderful doctor in a town called Buena Vista, called Buena Vista by Coloradans. And he told me what to do at births and uh, this, these two particular women that I worked with decided in their labor that they were gonna have their babies in the hospital, which was fine by me. I was just a have one, see one, catch one kind of gal. We, we later called it that. My level of care was to nurture the families, nurture the families. I took herbs, I took meals, I, I went to birth, to, um, and then eventually got better and better at what I was doing. Moved here in 85 or 84 and went down to El Paso for an internship program and got really good. 
at being a midwife at that time. So since then, I've probably done, since 1984, I've probably done 850 births. I call myself a recovered hippie. I was a hippie. And we were trying to create a new society, create a way of being with our children. Because when I was born, we were given formula, I mean formula, and because breastfilled breast milk, you couldn't possibly know how much food your child was getting, but they put cereal in it so that we would sleep for four hour stretches and we were not to be picked up sooner than that because we might be spoiled. We're talking infants, newborns, and um, it's kind of tragic when you think of that and how our parents treated us versus how we treated our children. And I, I can't really defend giving so much power to a well, I can give all power to a newborn, but to a two-year-old, I think we indulged them. We didn't quite get that boundary setting might be an important thing, and because that wasn't a word then. You didn't set boundaries in 1975 or four. <laughs> it wasn't a concept. Par uh, family systems wasn't a concept. But we knew that babies and children are important, that they have their own agenda that they come with, that that they know much more than we could ever um, imagine at birth. So you had quite a life before you became a doctor. Of course. <laughs> Three um, children. Well, actually, when I was probably 13, my, my great aunt, my grandmother's sister, was one of the head nurses at Sutter Maternity Hospital down in Old Town, Sacramento area and had been there probably, I don't know, from the, well, definitely from the 20s on to probably the 50s. And 13-year-olds can be outspoken and sometimes obnoxious. So <laughs> when my aunt was visiting one time, I was talking about, you know, wanting to be, I knew I wanted to be in healthcare since I was about 9 or 10. And she goes, well, you really probably can't be a nurse because you have too many opinions, so you better plan on being a doctor. So I was planning to be a doctor by the time I was 13. 13? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have a, my undergraduate degree is in holistic health, and I got it approved through the State Department of Education in 1977. And to my understanding, it's the first degree in holistic health granted in the United States. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that's unique. And then my senior year, I met the father of my children and knew that um, we were going to have a family together. And I didn't want to leave young children to someone else's care. And I had a firm belief in Eric Erickson's work that, you know, the first three years of life truly establish who we are as human beings and uh. didn't feel comfortable with leaving my children in someone else's care, wanted to actively be involved with that. So after graduating from school, it was another six years before we had children, but from 1986 when my daughter was born to 1996 when I went back to medical school, I didn't go back until my son was over three years old. And Erickson was the psychologist who inspired your thinking. Really, that concept of we are, you know, if we have this sense of, of being safe in our own being, those first three year, years of life are critical to that, to that yes. de development of, of love and trust and, yes. and autonomy. Um, and then I had been around lots of normal birth because I apprenticed under um, the senior uh, midwife in Humboldt County who was doing doing home births there, so I did an apprenticeship with her. So I was an familiar. Apprenticeship. Yes, I was familiar with, you know, normal natural birth and comfortable in my body. So I went into my own birth with that, most absolutely. So you were kind of trained and tutored by midwives before you went to medical school then? Yeah, I worked in birth since 1977. So that fall started working with um, the midwives in Humboldt County since 1977. I'm impressed with this because it seems to me pretty rare for obstetricians to have such a close relationship, a working, a harmonious working relationship with midwives. Well, hopefully all our goals are to help create a safe and empowering setting, a sacred space for for women and families for birth. And so there shouldn't be... Um, conflict between, I mean, really what we're looking for is a safe place for birth. Right. And um, 
those can be different places for different reasons. Well, this makes me wonder um, how you might have been affected when you got to medical school <laughs> and, and you learned a medical point of view and then into obstetrics. The medical, the obstetrical attitudes and norms and protocols well, um, there, there are not very many of us that's, that have bridged, bridged both. Yes. Um, the reason I went, continued on into the obstetrics part was that um, at first I came from a rural area. I was rural California. I was born in Mendocino County and then lived in Lassen County. And where I was from, there were actually a lot of family practice doctors doing obstetrics. But when I got down to the city, um, even though it's a small city, there there wasn't a single family practice doctor doing obstetrics. And so I quickly learned that I would need to alter my view a bit because it's important to me to be able to do continuity of care. So there's some people they have to transfer out with very high risk, and I transfer to perinatologists. But with the training I have, I can safely go from, you know, from normal birth to interventions as needed. And so I think that having the skill level of knowing what normal birth is about and being able to uh, work with that comfortably, but also being able to do a C-section within 10 minutes, those are skills that I want to have for the women I work with. And it requires that spectrum of training to have that. Yeah. I was wondering what you thought of uh, the cesarean rate in our culture at the moment. Like well, one out of three, almost. Okay. I think my rate's a little less than 5%. So um, I think cesareans are life-saving at times and very, very important to have when needed. Um, I know that the rate, there's a big spectrum. Um, ACOG is actually asking us to get below 20. Uh, a few years back, they were asking it to below 15 and realized that probably isn't going to happen. Um, there are lots of reasons for cesarean. Um, you know, in order to, my, my goal in part is to be able to offer care across a spectrum of needs and also over time. And so to be able to do that in California, I actually have to fall within those guidelines. So there are certain things right now that ACOG is saying, you know, you really need to offer a cesarean for. One is if the baby's breech. And if they're, you know, you can attempt a uh, version, a valid version, turn the baby, um, if the, the butt's down to get them to turn so their head down. Um, and those can be successful 75% of the time, but part of the time they're not. And there's a study that came out a few years ago stating that um, when you look across the board, um, the outcomes, uh, primarily they're looking at neurologic outcomes, are not as high for babies that were born in a breech presentation than, than for a C-section. So that's one of the things currently being encouraged for C-section. Another issue for the high rate of C-section is, is repeat C-sections. And so you sort of have, you know, the, you know, you're kind of chasing that tail, which comes first. But um, the requirements for uh, what's called a TOLAC, a trial of labor after um, cesarean, and with the goal of being VBAC, a vaginal birth after cesarean, um, the requirements for the hospital are, are hard to meet even in a teaching hospital. Basically what they're asking for is that in the term window, which is 37 weeks to 42 weeks, so, so for a five-week period, that, that the obstetrician is available in-house if that person goes into labor for complete time from active labor through delivery, that the pediatrician is in-house and actively there from onset of labor to delivery, that the anesthesiologist is there. And, and that you can sort of guarantee that you can get this child out if there is a problem in minutes. And the reason is not that rupture of the uterus is common, but it's catastrophic it, if it happens. So if from the old scar you have a rupture, then the baby can go out of the womb into the abdominal space, and the baby can die and mom can bleed to death. And so you have to be able to respond really quickly. That's hard to do even in a hospital that has all those requirements officially met. And the only place that has a doctor there 24 hours a day is a residence training program. So it's really the medical centers that have that. So now that that's being stated as a standard, it makes it really difficult for anything other than a teaching hospital to meet those requirements.
again, that, that idea of choice. There are people that are requesting primary cesarean sections electively. And that's something that people come in asking for. Yes. What do you? How do you handle that? Do you think that they ought to be deciding how to do, how to have the birth surgically, or you, you ought know, to? I be really, part of that? I really do believe that people should have the you know, women have the right to make choices about their body, and that's that's been an issue that's come around many times, and yeah. been attempted to be taken away many times, but. Um, what I do try to let people know is that cesarean is a major surgery and that, you know, the recovery from a vaginal delivery can be hours to days and from major surgery it's at least six weeks. Mm -hmm. And so if you're trying to take care of a newborn um, when you've just had major surgery, that's a lot harder to do and, and it takes that healing time. On the other hand, there are, you know, it's still a choice. I mean, it, it still should be a choice. Because some of the information we don't have, I mean, um, you know, pelvic organ prolapse, one of the issues is vaginal delivery. So, you know, if people are, are reading and if they're, you know, aware of what it is they're choosing, then I think they have a right to that choice. Um, I mean, the baby's heartbeat starts at 21 days, mm -hmm. and so that you know, the back and forth between the maternal heart and the baby's heart is very early on, yes. uh, very early part of the first trimester. Um, the baby's hearing comes into play. Um, I know with my pregnancies we talked and sang to our children and played guitar near them. And um, I would say, you know, my daughter was born in 1986 and prior to that I had read books about unconditional love and read self-help books. and you know, had this concept in my mind, but when I actually felt it was when I held my daughter in my arms after her birth. So mm -hmm. I remember when she was born, her coming up t onto my chest, and before she opened her eyes, I could see pass across her face every human emotion that I would, could put a name to. Sorrow, joy, bliss, terror, just everything fa flashed across her face. You could see it I all. I could see that. Yeah. She opened her eyes, and I experienced unconditional love. So, do I encourage birth as a sacred event and bonding between, you know, these beings as happening? Absolutely. Yes. I think that calls for a rather different belief about the nature of a baby. Does that sound right? Well, different from whose point of view? Different from textbooks Yours. in medical the, the school mothers. or different from... <laughs> 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 I mean, I've gotten myself in trouble for years on that one. Um, <laughs> my my paper anniversary, which was, what, 1982, I got Mothering Magazine, which I continued to read for decades. I'm and the editor. Okay. <laughs> well, I think always, even, even now, I think oftentimes there are articles that um, are sort of five or ten years in front of what then becomes mainstream. So a lot of these ideas that have progressed from the 1970s to 2008 um, have been initiated by women and families um, and then do become mainstream. I'm actually pretty excited about where we are and the fact that we can mm -hmm. have this kind of openness and that, you know, um, the hospitals have a birth tub and they have a, a you know, encourage movement and um, a birth tub. Birth tub. So just the idea, though, that many of, you know, the rehumanizing of birth um, has has come from yes, from home birth and from alternatives, but is now more and more available. So I'm Vanita Lott. I'm a certified nurse midwife. I w was practicing as a nurse since 1983 in low and high risk obstetrics, mostly in hospital settings. And I also was a rebirther, which is a technique of a regression technique using the breath. And it got the term rebirthing because a fair number of adults had birth memories. So they would have general regressions and memories. Um, the birth memories, I guess, were the most dramatic. And so it got termed as rebirthing. And I studied that with Leonard Orr, the founder of rebirthing, for many years. And... Um, um, lived in a community with him and was very active doing seminars, once went on a world tour with him and did seminars in Europe and stuff. 
So I was, um, came into midwifery with a strong scientific clinical background, having worked in hospitals for a long time, and then also having this awareness of the trauma that standard birth experiences or birth trauma, you know, that wasn't necessarily obstetrically caused, but normal birth trauma could cause the effects that it had on adults. And probably the story that for me is the most dramatic about that was I had a friend who had agoraphobia, which is called fear of the marketplace. And this woman, she was in her 40s, and she was afraid of leaving her home or going outside without a man present. And doing rebirthing on her, we discovered that at her birth, she was born in a hospital. Her, she was being born very quickly. The physician was not in the hospital. And the nurses were there. And the nurses were, ter though this isn't good or um, encouraged nursing procedure, the nurses were afraid to do the birth without the physician present. And so they took her mother's legs and um, held them together and the, um, prevented her from being born till the physician arrived. So you have a baby that was getting decreased oxygen trapped in the birth canal. And um, then when the physician, the male physician arrived, they allowed her to be born and she was imprinted or programmed with this belief that it's not safe to go outside unless a man is present. And so that's probably one of the most dramatic examples of how birth can um, affect a child. And having studied that and watched people go through different birth experiences, I became very motivated to not only provide care for women to have as safe a birth as possible, but also for women to be empowered through childbirth so that they are better mothers and empowered as women, and also so that babies could have as gentle a birth as possible and to try to save babies from unnecessary psychological, emotional, uh, obviously physical birth trauma also, but physical and psychological and emotional um, birth trauma, which seems to be rampant in the generations that have, the few generations that have come before us with the advent of hospital birth. I'm not against hospital birth and I'm not against obstetrics. I think that they've done a great job in saving babies and saving mothers. And we obviously, um, women don't die very often in childbirth and babies don't die that often anymore in childbirth either. But it seems that the price that we have paid for this 100 year experiment of medically oriented childbirth is that now we have a thing where obstetrics is actually causing complications. And an oath that physicians take is to do no harm, but the fact is a tremendous amount of harm is being done on a daily basis. The cesarean section rate has exceeded 30% now. Um, women, two thirds of the women in the United States are give birth with epidurals. And in my experience in a normal labor, uh, most women choose to use epidurals for fear and not actually for pain. It's been my experience that women, even in a hospital setting, can deal with whatever is happening at the moment. They tend to choose to use an epidural because they're afraid of what they think they're going to experience in the future. And so we're using a tremendous amount of pain medication and anesthesia because women are afraid. And instead of people supporting women in prenatal care, in building their confidence and um, providing birth arenas where women can um, feel supported and feel that they're with care providers who support them. Um, a lot of women are using, are being frightened actually by some of the prenatal care. I'm quite amazed as a clinician how many stories I hear of information that women get that is just simply fear producing. And so instead of reassuring women, women are being frightened. And then we use anesthesia more for fear than pain. And that is just so amazing to me. The, there's obviously some very serious side effects of epidurals, which are very much downplayed. But I've given lectures to nurses, and the list of side effects for epidurals is very long for the mother and for the baby. Probably the most dramatic is that the cesarean section rate is up with babies that are born um, 
women who are pregnant laboring with um, an epidural and um, there's this artifact where a baby's temperature or a mother's temperature go up and it doesn't mean there's a fever but there's no way to distinguish if there's an infectious process or not and so babies are subjected to being put in a nursery separated from their mothers, IVs, and antibiotics when there's no infection present. So th there's some very serious side effects of epidurals and where I believe epidurals are a wonderful thing for women with certain complicated labors. I've transported women to hospitals where they've needed, say, Pitocin and an epidural to have a normal birth. It's a shame to me that we are adding tremendous amount of side effects um, to normal labors and that women do not feel confident that they have the ability to give birth. And I think it's a shame. I think that the obvious solution to a lot of the obstetrical, the obstetrical crisis that is going on in the United States is um, midwives. And I think that's a very obvious solution. And if you're trying to decide where to give birth, if you want to know whether a hospital's progressive or not, the only thing you need to ask is if there's midwives on staff or not. That's probably the simplest question you can ask. And if you're wondering why there aren't midwives in all the hospitals in the United States, um, the answer is really controlled by obstetricians and there's a tremendous amount of financial and power incentives um, where obstetricians are trying to limit midwives practicing in hospitals. I think that um, there's an illusion amongst American women that, you know, they have a tremendous amount of choice now, you know, like they can choose whether to have their baby induced on a certain day or not, or um, I'm definitely not into elective cesarean sections for a first baby, except in some rare circumstances. The, the women might think, wow, I, I get to have a choice. Um, I don't think that women are making that choice. I don't think women are really getting fully informed consent. And I think it's an odd situation where women are actually even being offered to have surgery without any indication because it seems to me strange to be offering women a procedure which increases the can increase the complications and can increase the expense um, of the birth. We know that inductions um, cause complications. We know the last time I checked, and I'm sure it's up, 20% of the births in America were being induced, and the great majority of those without medical indication, where obviously there are certain complications where you would want to induce a baby, um, a mother with preeclampsia, say, or um, a baby that is starting to not do well in the womb or the placenta is aging. You obviously want to facilitate that child being born. Um, we know that routine inductions without medical indication are increasing the rate of pain medication used, the epidural rate being used, have more instrumental deliveries, births by forceps or vacuum extractions, and increased cesarean sections. And so, it's a shame to me that physicians, a lot of times for the physician's convenience, will offer a woman an induction. And obviously there's a large secondary gain for physicians when really it seems to me rather obvious that one thing that's motivating physicians to offer cesarean sections and inductions is so that physicians can try to be doing births more during the daytime um, and sleeping through the night, which um, I can totally relate to. I mean, it's just um, most obstetricians and midwives, we like sleeping through the night. But it seems to me that if we're going to be have this sacred position where we are helping women to give birth, that um, that's an inconvenience that we need to deal with. And it, it scares me that there's so many things going on in our healthcare system in obstetrics, which seem to be designed for the convenience of the providers and the hospital and the hospital staff instead of for the women. I have felt like um, it's actually a fallacy that our system has been created to serve the needs of women and babies. Most of the hospitals in the United States, it's very rare that a hospital in the United States meets the criteria of being mother and baby friendly. And I have seen hospitals not want to be mother and baby friendly. 
And I think that that's pretty shocking. Another thing is a lot of people think they can call a hospital and just find out what the cesarean section rate is for that hospital, but a lot of times people are not given accurate information. They're told what the primary cesarean section rate is, which is the cesareans um, that are being done on first-time mothers, but they're not really being told the total. And so if you're ever trying to determine um, what that is for a hospital or a physician, you need to be very clear that you want to know the total cesarean section rate. Because they tell people the primary rate and people compare that to the national rate and think a hospital is doing better, but the total rate needs to be what's being compared to the national rate. Um, so... Again, like I said before, I think that care that really truly is mother-friendly would be empowering women that their bodies were designed to give birth. The medical, one of the downsides of the obstetrical focus is a pathology and, you know, what could go wrong. Where women aren't taught, most women don't even know about their bodies. Most women don't know that the vagina, it, it's not actually a tube. The, the vagina is actually shaped more like this and that um, it's a potential space and it's designed to receive a baby. Most women are, have been trained that uh, the information they have even about their f um, physiology and their anatomy is, is colored by um, a male perception. Everything that women are exposed to is colored by a male perception. And so most women don't even understand that like the womb is sort of like a constant erection. Someone once handed me a uterus in an operating room on a woman who had just had a hysterectomy who wasn't pregnant. And they, so they handed me, which is a pretty odd situation, if someone put someone's uterus or womb in your hand. But I realized it was hard and firm like an erect penis and that women's power is hidden inside of them, but they're always strong and their strength is constant. Where an erection, you know, comes and goes, um, women's power is deep inside of them. It's kind of hidden, but it's, um, it's constantly present, and most women have no idea about that. They have no idea that the vagina is meant to stretch. They, um, they have no idea about, you know, tearing, and a lot of women are afraid of tearing, and we have providers who do episiotomies routinely, which is scientifically been shown to, um, to actually be dangerous to be doing routine cutting of the vaginal opening when a baby is born. We know that from science, we know that obstetrics got the wooden, sp the wooden spoon award recently um, by the Cochrane database, um, which was a database that was set up to research all of the um, so-called traditional beliefs about medicine and the medical model. And obstetrics was shown to be the least scientific of all of the medical specialties. And that a tremendous amount of the information and things that have routinely been told to people like, oh, a laceration, it'd be better to cut you than for you to have a laceration or um, a, t a lot of things that have happened that have been shown to be scientifically invalid. And women having a spontaneous labor, to me, should be the ideal. It's not an ideal that we can always um, accomplish, but th it's always best for a woman to go into labor on her own. If that's possible, it's, she's going to have the easiest labor. She, it's going to be the difference between, um, you know, kind of making love under ideal circumstances and loving the person and having a quiet, maybe candlelit environment as compared to trying to have sex, you know, like in an exam room or something while you're being uh, monitored. Um, the body, the hormonal milieu, the hormones are orchestrated in a very, there's a very delicate balance. And just as you could throw off lovemaking just by having a stranger come into the room or having too much noise or too much light, we're throwing off the birth process um, constantly. So um, a lot of midwifery is trying to create ideal environments. And I think um, women do best in very nesty, cozy environments. Women are much more comfortable in their home. Um, the power dynamics of home birth are very different. Um, having worked in hospitals for a long time, when women come and give birth in a hospital setting, 
We're, they're put through rituals where they are um, disempowered, you know, taking away their identity by having them take off their clothes, putting them in a hospital gown, um, attaching them to machines. All these sort of routines t teach them on a certain level, you are now hospital property. And it's very clear that when you go into a hospital that you're on the physicians and the hospitals and the nurses' territory. And having done home births now for nine years, I know that being in someone's home, I'm an honored guest in their home, but I'm a guest in their home. And the power dynamics are different. They are, it's their home, I'm in their home. And um, the care that they get is much more personalized and much more individualized. For an example, hospitals routinely give babies injections of vitamin K and um, it's a painful procedure and the, most hospitals do it without even asking the parents permission. They just come in and they give a baby an injection of vitamin K because the pediatrician's um, position is that that's the safest thing to do to prevent um, hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, which can be a potentially serious thing. But nobody, I mean, I would never dream of just walking up and giving a baby a, an injection in someone's home. The people who choose home births tend to want a very individualized, personalized care. And I'd be afraid actually of being attacked if I tried to give a baby an injection without the parent's permission in their home. Parents, we discuss though parents in the hospital settings that I've seen in all throughout the nation are, aren't even asked about the um, vitamin K. In the home visit, in home birth, we do a home visit a month before where parents read all the stuff and have to decide, you know, do they want an injection of vitamin K? Do they want oral vitamin K? Do they want, once in a while, parents refuse any vitamin K? So it's just a small example of the difference in the power dynamics. If you've never heard of bonding disorders or attachment disorders, it seems that this country is suffering from several generations where the, the masses have suffered very serious attachment and bonding disorders just based on, um, I believe it starts prenatally, and um, the birth practices of our culture and then also the child rearing practices of the culture. And um, I feel that I've had a serious attachment disorder and I think that part of the reason we are seeing so many people having problems in relationships and probably part of the high divorce rate in the United States is that people have been so emotionally damaged though you know maybe we improve the physical safety of, of birth with some of these medical practices in the past um, 100 years um, we also have caused a tremendous amount of physical problems, which people are always amazed. I'm always shocked when people are like, they assume that you definitely would be safer in a hospital. And I have seen situations where um, women's lives have been endangered and babies' lives have been endangered by standard medical practices. And so there is the assumption that you're always safer in a hospital does not play out. And then there are people who think that just because you're at home with a midwife that you're safer. And, you know, there are definitely midwives that aren't very professional. There are definitely midwives practicing who don't um, have a good education or a good training and have done dangerous things at home. And so it's not as simple as being at home or being in a hospital. Um, there's obviously a lot of things that go into trying to create a conscious birth. And... I believe that we need very highly trained birth attendants because there are people who, in trying to avoid emotional and um, psychological birth trauma, have created some very serious physical trauma or even death. And so, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into creating a conscious birth. And I heard someone saying it's true too, just because you have a tub or you labor or give birth in a tub doesn't make it a conscious birth. To really, really good preparation for birth really includes mothers dealing with their past traumas, um, you know, fathers dealing with their past traumas, dealing with the family. I always try to really educate a whole family, the grandparents, because if the grandparents are freaked out, these people are part of a system. And so there's really a lot that goes into very conscious um, prenatal care. I offer all my clients a session 
um, a birth visualization, um, conscious regression sessions, where we go back and try to deal with unresolved issues, and it's, that's very individualized um, care. And we try to encourage women to work um, on that level. And just because someone winds up with a cesarean doesn't mean that they failed. I've seen people who've probably grown more spiritually by having a birth not go the way they wanted it to go and really how to really learn how to truly surrender their ego by having a cesarean and winding up in a hospital. So it's a very complex issue and I think people try to make it a little too simplistic at times. But it's clear to me that the medical profession pretty much deals with women's pregnancies and labor and birth and newborns on a physical level. And that I think is very damaging. In doing my own birth regression work, my, my mother hated her obstetrician. My mother had her own issues that she hadn't worked out and she hated the obstetrician who was a man when I was born and she was asleep when I was born. And I felt like I was being treated like a piece of meat. And I feel that that has left um, imprints on me and probably is part of the reason I do the work that I do. Because babies are um, souls coming into, onto this planet. And I think babies should be treated with love and respect and as much gentleness as possible. And um, I just think it's too powerful an event in a family's life, in a woman's life, and in a baby's life. It's just way too important to, um, to be on an assembly line. I think that as a culture, that we, this is how we are dehumanizing and making our society more mechanical, is um, by starting birth out on an assembly line. And I think that there are some very serious implications for us as a society when children are treated like they're a number or um, um, they're being born in environments where there's no personal connection, there's no emotional connection. Um, we're imprinting children on corporate, a lot of babies are being born in corporate hospitals. I mean, we're imprinting babies on corporate values from the moment that they're being born. And um, does that mean you shouldn't have your baby in a corporate hospital? No, but I think these are things that need to be thought about and things that need to be considered. I know from working in corporate hospitals that um, some uh, usually the things that motivate change are usually financial. And I've seen hospitals try to um, improve care, but a lot of times the motivation was for them to save money. It wasn't to improve um, you know, the development or the quality of human consciousness. Babies being born with a lot of pain are going to have pain imprinted on their body that they're going to have to um, work out or act out later on in their lives. And um, it's just, I just think a lot, there can be a lot better job. I think we need to start going back to the basics. I would like to see in this culture, take our traditional midwifery model, which was the model that operated on this planet for thousands of years, and now take the advantages of modern medicine and blend them together. This very feminine approach, which was traditional midwifery, and then this very masculine approach, which is modern medicine. I think now it's ni it would be nice to blend them in a way that tended to have more of the benefits of the feminine system, but also had access um, to more of the male model, more of the left brain model too. Because to me, both of these systems have advantages and disadvantages. And I think we're in an ideal time and place in this country where we really can have the best. You can have very professional out of hospital births. You could have very loving home births in. Um, you could add more of a love, because to me that's really the bottom line is, is there love present? Is there love present? That should really be probably the main criteria you want, you know, in your birth, whether regardless of the setting. Do you feel cared for? by your providers? Do you feel that oh, there's always time for you to have all your questions answered? Um, 
we know that most women spend five to six minutes with their obstetrician in a prenatal visit, and I know that um, that that's grossly inadequate. In five to six minutes, you can only deal with people on the the most rudimentary physical levels. Uh, even on a physical level, it's dangerous. We know that the prenatal care, even on a physical level, isn't working well in the United States. There's very little focus on wellness. There's very little focus on prevention. It's just pretty much um, the, the most basics of surveillance and then picking up problems when they're occurring, but there's no prevention of them. There is a real fear about childbirth, I believe, in the collective unconscious. You know, we all, um, in the collective unconscious, I mean, there's this program that birth is dangerous. And, um, you know, years ago, women and babies died routinely in childbirth. And um, I think that's a fear that people need to address, you know, when they are approaching childbirth. Men tend to, um, a lot of times men want a baby to be born in the hospital because they think that that's, you know, where their wife and the baby would be safest. And though that's sort of a knee-jerk sort of reaction, um, people really need to research their options much more thoroughly than that. Like I've said before, um, if I clearly thought people were safer in a hospital, I would be working in hospitals, and that is not where I choose to work. I think that um, it's been demonstrated that professional midwifery out of hospital can be very safe. There's another issue about men at childbirth, like um, women for thousands of years have given birth, usually surrounded by other women. In, in a tribal or a village situation, women have given birth surrounded by their family, their friends, usually the woman who is the healer and the midwife and the healer and the herbalist in the community. So women, the real classic way women have given birth traditionally is surrounded by other women. Men have rarely, except for the past several hundred years, been involved with childbirth um, hardly at all. And as a reaction then to the severe um, restriction of women where men weren't even allowed, women were alone giving birth in hospitals, it was a great advance when they allowed the father then, I mean, it's, it's amazing to me this allowed the father, but when they allowed the father, if you can imagine how even bizarre that concept is, is that the hospital's allowing the father to be there. Um, but when that changed, that was good because it um, decreased a woman's isolation. But it, it seems that the majority of women need women to be with them, whether the father's there or not. Um, and there's plenty of women I've met who really wanted the father to be there, but once they go into labor, they want a woman with them. And um, one thing that I think is very disempowering and is sort of a real strange patriarchal aberration is this idea of men as being labor coaches. I think it's ludicrous to think of a husband as a labor coach. And I, the, I, I mean, it's insane to me that anybody would call a father a labor coach because it implies, again, that there's a man in charge of the process and he's coaching the woman. Well, how can you coach somebody on something that you've never been through? And I've, when I worked in hospital situations, I would come in, and this is a very classic thing, you'd see a mother you know, in labor, usually in a bed, lying in a bed, because that's kind of the only place to be, often in a hospital room, and a father you know, looking panic-stricken. And though someone told him he was the coach, he knows that he's totally, practically incapable of coaching her. And um, I would come in and say, I know you were trained that you were the coach, but it's ridiculous. And um, you know what? I'll help you. And most women just intuitively, women more so have an intuitive capacity to be with other women in labor. And it, we know that women being with women in labor helps them to do better, less cesareans, less medication and stuff like that. So I feel like undue pressure has been put on men to be coaches and... Um, there's a lot of women, I've seen women who like force men to be with them in labor, 
and at times that has seemed violent to me because um, there are certainly men who have not wanted to be around in labor, though most men enjoy it. There are men who have not wanted to be there. And um, I always say that, you know, someone should be at choice whether they're there or not. It, it, it upsets me when, and I did that to my first husband. He didn't want to be there, and I was like, I'm going to be there, you're going to be there. But um, it, I think it can be disrespectful. I think when you individualize care, there's really no formula. You have to look at every situation in every family. I've seen fathers who have a lot of unresolved what seems to me from their stories and their reactions have a lot of unresolved birth trauma from their own births. And, um, and I have done sessions with fathers to help them work through either their own birth trauma or the, the trauma they're carrying from a previous birth. I've had people who've had birth, the father has been traumatized from the last labor of his wife. And we've had to work that through before they could, um, you know, relax and even be willing to agree to a home birth, or fathers who just have medical trauma from, you know, accidents or some medical condition, and they carry a lot of resentment against the hospital or medical people. And uh, there's a lot of things that people, if they really want a conscious birth, really need to be addressed and worked out. To try to make people more aware that the choices that they're making are going to affect that woman they're going to affect that baby's psychology, that baby's imprinting. Um, spiritually, it's going to affect the entire world. You know, I guess you could say our mission is sort of changing this world one baby, one mother, one family at a time. Because um, when babies are treated violently or treated unconsciously, like we create pain. And it seems that a lot of this pain is being acted out on this planet unconsciously. A lot of people, though most people don't remember their births consciously, they can, but that most people do have that imprint. And um, if we want to start to heal this world and make this world a more peaceful world, we're going to need to bring a lot of consciousness in how we treat pregnant women, how we treat women in general, how we treat men and um, how we're going to treat our precious, vulnerable um, newborn children. Mm -hmm.